Hi, I'm Ben. I've worked on site as a bricklayer for over a decade. For the last five years, I've been a building inspector and I've recently renovated my own property. Let me share with you my knowledge with 10 tips of things you need to know before you get started. Let's get into it. Don't start straight away. So you've got your house which needs some or a lot of renovations. Firstly, stop. Spend some time in the property working out what you want from that property. For example, do you have lots of family or friends over often so you need a larger entertaining space? Or does your dog get the floor dirty on a winter's day, meaning you need a boot room to wash him off? Work out which rooms you use the most or are there rooms you hardly use at all? Consider what time of day light streams through certain windows. Are there parts of the house that are particularly warmer or colder? Whatever it is you need, work that out first before you start knocking walls down or building extensions that you don't need. Put together a wish list or a scrapbook. Create a wish list of things you want your renovation to have, whether that's more light, underfloor heating, a new kitchen, loft conversion, an extra bedroom, maybe even a spiral wine cellar. Put all these ideas into a scrapbook because doing the designing early on will help you later. Know your house's limits. It can be easy to say we'll add an extension or do a loft conversion but be mindful that each house and each street has a ceiling price. By ceiling price I mean there is a max price that any one house will sell for. This can depend on a number of factors. How much land the house comes with and the supply and demand among other factors. You want to ensure you don't spend too much money on your renovation so that you can see a return on your investment when you eventually sell the property. You can work out your house's ceiling price by talking to local estate agents or looking at sites like Zoopla for recent sale prices for comparable properties. Believe it or not, you can move the stairs. Yes, it's true, you can move the stairs. Although, not every situation will call for it, but by doing so, this can open up a house to be used more efficiently by taking advantage of natural light and using space wisely. Sketch out a plan of your house and play around with moving internal walls to form different layouts. Bear in mind that moving walls often means structural changes, so this tends to be an expensive option. Hire the professionals. Appoint an architect, building control, and a structural engineer. At this point, you can give your architect your scrapbook, which you made earlier, and they'll be able to better understand what you like and what you're trying to achieve. An architect will be able to steer you in making wise decisions and away from making mistakes. They'll also be able to help you apply for planning permission, if that's needed, and supply relevant planning drawings. A common mistake I've seen on site is people compromising the building fabric by using the wrong materials, whether that's not using a lime plaster on solid walls that need to breathe, or removing all the trickle vents from a property and then wondering why there's mould. An architect can help you avoid these sorts of mistakes. Don't be scared to appoint the professionals. In the long run, they'll help you save money by avoiding costly mistakes and ensuring the end result is high quality. Find the right builder. Now you're ready to find the right builder. I didn't include this in the previous point because they deserve their own spot. The right builder isn't just a builder. They're professional craftsmen with specialized skills. Finding the right builder is key. You don't want to just hire the cheapest. This will mean that you pay more in the long run because they won't have priced the job correctly, so it will often leave site when work is unfinished. Or maybe even cut corners to save money, meaning you'll end up employing another builder to fix it. A builder is someone you want to get along with, as you need to be able to work with this person and trust them. Do they see your vision? And can they deliver the result you're looking for? Are they someone you can build a rapport with? It's important that you feel safe enough that you can ask that stupid question so you can have that five minute conversation. That might avoid having to redo a job six months later. When searching for a builder, ask family, friends, neighbours for recommendations as you can see examples of the builder's work and ask them what they would like to work with. Be realistic with timescales. You need to be realistic. A two-storey extension with multiple structural alterations is going to take longer than fitting a new kitchen or bathroom. Talk with your builder about how long they think it will take and then allow extra time for unforeseen delays or additional work that may become apparent. 
I recommend creating a schedule in Excel. This will help to keep on top of timings and budgets by listing which trade does what, when, and how much that element will cost. A schedule ensures you're not paying trades to sit around and wait. If you're ordering your own materials, this helps manage the timings of deliveries. Deal with expectations early. Renovations and construction work is never straightforward. There is always some form of delay, and if you anticipate this from the offset, you won't be disappointed. Equally, don't try and cut corners to speed things along. It's quicker and cheaper to do a job right once than it is to go back and put it right. Beware of hidden costs. When figuring out whether you can afford the size of renovation project you want, check and double check if you haven't missed anything. Don't overlook that you may have to pay directly for things like building control, a material with a higher quality, or an extra your builder just hasn't priced for. Then you'll need to soak up the cost. Two things people forget to budget for are waste disposal and extra costs for foundations due to nearby trees. A skip or grab lorry can cost anywhere between two to three hundred pounds. Bear in mind if you haven't got anywhere to store your waste, you'll need a street permit. As for foundations, your architect or building control can advise you on foundation depth required before breaking ground. For these reasons and more, it's important to factor in a contingency budget. This is a percentage of the overall cost of work and is typically between 5 and 10%. Get renovation insurance. You may find that your existing house insurance doesn't cover you for the work you want to carry out, leaving you in a very vulnerable and potentially very expensive position should something go wrong. It's worth calling your insurance provider and having a chat to find out what exactly you're covered for and if you can upgrade. It may make sense to change provider altogether. Living on site is hard. Living on site isn't for the faint hearted, although it does make sense for a lot of people as it means you don't have to pay rent on top of mortgage payments and you can be on hand to answer questions from tradesmen and your builder. Then there's the inescapable dust that comes from construction work that is hard to keep away from. This dust just gets everywhere. Living on site also slows down the project as it reduces the space the builder and the trades have to work in, while having to make temporary connections for services when they could just be cut. Sometimes living on site just isn't practical. If you don't live on site, you should make regular site visits so questions can be answered, and you can check that things are being constructed in the correct locations and work is progressing as a drawing. There are pros and cons to both sides and you should choose which works best for you. Make savings where you can. If you have a budget left, I strongly recommend spending the money to upgrade items that you can touch and feel, like kitchen worktops, interior doors, among other things. This will give you a high quality finish without breaking the bank. That means you can save money in areas that are unseen. For example, you may opt to buy things second hand to reuse, repurpose or rehome. If you're trying to save money, the DIY approach can work really well by taking on the more labour intensive jobs so you don't have to pay a skilled tradesman to do it. So that was my thoughts on a guide to renovations. If you've got any questions, do drop them in the comments below. Thank you for watching. If you haven't already, consider subscribing. We'll see you next time.